Did it? Did you hear it say that? Okay, so now you know. We're recording. And the reason that I'm recording this class is because I, I don't know who's going to see this, but hopefully some prospective Springfield College students, people that are thinking about coming here, but they're not sure what a college class is like, maybe especially during a pandemic. I wanted to showcase a small class. Uh, this is a class that's in the honors program, so that's exciting to showcase. And part of the other sort of thing that I think prospective students might have in their minds as they come to a school is if they don't know what they want to major in, they want to see just what a typical general class might look like, a class that maybe they would have to take for their general education requirements. So for everybody here, this class satisfies one of the requirements of the core curriculum. It's the spiritual and ethical dimensions uh, requirement. So I thought I'd give people a, a little preview of what a class like that could look like. So this is a class on the good life. And now we're gonna get back to what we've been doing uh, in general here. There is a reading question journal submission due today. And I've gotten a few questions about this. You can submit it right to Brightspace. Even though that thing says that it's due on, um, says it's due on May 5th, but you can still just pull something in, submit it to here, and then you'll be able to upload multiple times. And I'll only just look at the most recent submission. So that's where you should put it. That way, when I go to check in on you, I can just see all of them in one place. I went through your vision papers. That was so fun. I loved reading those. Um, it made me remember fondly what it's like to be an undergrad. And it also, some of them made me very hungry because a lot of your awesome days involved particular types of food. <laughs> that sounded delicious. So I put some quick comments on them, just kind of opining on, you know, how I reacted to your various descriptions. There was such a nice variety of writing. Some people were considering the, the, the best day given that there's a pandemic going on. And other people considered the best day in the future when they have a career. And other people considered the best day that they have experienced already and thought this is pretty much, this captures it. So it was cool to see all of the different angles. I'm not gonna share these with anybody. I should have said that at the very beginning, okay? It's just between you and me. And what I'll do, later in the semester uh, is I'll send it back to you. So you can keep a record, but I also have the file saved. I'll send it back to you and it'll be fun for you to look at it once we have a few theories under our belts so you can evaluate what you said and whether it aligns with any one of the particular theories. That's part of the idea. I guess I kind of encourage you to forget about it now. You, you know, don't look at it until later in the semester when we get a chance to think through it again, okay? Are there any questions about logistics? Cool. I'm trying to think if I'm forgetting anything important. So next week, we're back on campus, some of us, many of us. And Monday, we're going to be on Zoom together. Wednesday, we're going to be on Zoom together. Friday, everyone's coming to our class in person. That's because Friday next week is our first experience day. And I thought it'd be fun for us all to be together to talk about what we're thinking about doing or trying to do. So that's a preview. Let me share with you the link to my slides today. We have a lot of exciting stuff to try to go through. We'll see what we can cover. Okay, on your day off, on Wednesday, you watched a bunch of lectures about Epicurus. Man, that guy had some crazy ideas about the soul, huh? 
oh my goodness, <laughs> little soul particles inside of us that dissipate once we die. Did anybody have any thoughts about any of that stuff? I'm just curious. Okay, yeah, what, what do you got, Molly? I'll let Jess go first, because I have a question that I think will take us a little off course. <laughs> okay, go for it, Jess. Oh, shoot, mine's not very, there's not much substance to it, but I was thinking about it a lot while I was swimming. And I, I don't know, I was starting to wonder, like, can you develop more soul particles if you like use, like when I'm swimming, I'm like, I use my arms a lot. Can I develop more soul particles in my arms? Um, so I was, I was thinking about that and how maybe, maybe like by swimming, I'm developing more soul particles. I don't know. No, well, I think what's really interesting is if we like midi chlorians, that's from Star Wars, right? I actually don't know in Star Wars whether you can get more or if you just have them floating around in your blood. But, you know, you have to imagine that you are existing before the scientific revolution, okay? You have a completely different paradigm. You think about the world in completely differently, right? Like Epicurus, you're using your five senses. He's an empiricist. He's just trying to use his experiences of the everyday world to construct a theory about how it is that we have sensations at all. And you raise a really interesting point. Anyone who's familiar with like developing muscle memory or becoming, becoming more attuned to a particular type of sensation. Like I, was, I, was, I uh, took music classes in high school. I was in the band. And the more I was in those classes, it was like the more I was able to hear. So Epicurus might be sort of puzzled about how does this happen? How do, become, how do people become more sensitive to phenomena? And it seems to me like it would be a natural answer that he could give that, well, I can explain this very simply. You know, there's a, there's a lot more soul atoms out there than are just in your body. And as you become more sensitive to something, more soul atoms start to become incorporated into your body. That seems kind of natural, actually. In fact, that explanation seems better than some of the other ones that people offer. What do people say today? Neural connections form? I like that thought, Jess, that's interesting. Okay, Molly, you had a thought. Yes, so I was reading the news about, um, this has happened like a little bit ago, but I was just reflecting on it, about how, if anyone's heard of the GameStop stock incident. So, okay, right, so some of us have heard about it, but basically the will of the people moving towards a like popular company to upset you know, that of the elite or who's holding on to it. How did Epicurus, like other philosophers, I know that Aristotle and Plato definitely talked about government. Like, is there a connection with Epicurus from a good life to like the good government or no? No. Yeah. And this is a question exclusively to me or a question for us to sort of, I, I actually don't know a lot about what Epicurus is political perspectives were. Anyone at that time, any of those Greek philosophers that were advocating for a particular way of living, were doing so in the context of politics. Um, th this is like most extreme in the case of Plato, who Epicurus would definitely have known about. Plato thought that the, the political body or the government is almost has the same structure as the individual psychology. So just as the government needs to have a leader and soldiers and citizens, so also the individual person needs to have rationality, um, a, a body and a spirited part. Like Plato's like the triangle guy, spirit, mind and body. The individual person needs to have rationality to tell them what to do, like the leader. The, it has to have a spirit to get them motivated to actually do the stuff, like the army, and has to have a body that functions well, that can actually do the stuff, like the citizens. So Plato, this is kind of a roundabout way of trying to even get into an answer to your question. Plato would have thought at least that stuff we learn about the individual informs what we know about the government. 
And so Epicurus as advocating for us what it takes to live a good life might also be advocating for us what the ideal society would be like. One in which government policies advocate for people to be free from anxiety and able to pursue pleasures. I don't know how to directly tie that into GameStop, but I don't know quite the practical implication there. Yeah, those are good connections. Are there any other um, thoughts people had about Epicurus? I'd put it in the chat, but I also was thinking about when you were thinking of government during Epicurus's time, like they also kind of, they, that was during the time when there was like, they kind of thought like gods were also like their leaders, right? Oh, this is a good connection. Yeah, so the gods sit there on Mount Olympus in their mythology and are sort of governing their fate if something good happens to you, you can thank the gods. They've directed you in that way. If something bad happens to you, oh, curse those gods. Yeah. So it's such a good point. It's sort of like, it reminds me of something that he says in the letter to Menuhishas, which is a little abstract and confusing. He's like, the good life consists in understanding what the gods are like. I could try to pull up my screen and share it, but basically there's a passage in there. Let me see if I can bring it up. Passage in two here. First of all, believe that God is a being immortal and blessed, even as the common idea of a God is engraved on men's minds and do not assign to him anything alien to his immortality or ill-suited to his blessedness, but believe about him everything that can uphold his blessedness and immortality. I was reading this, I was like, what is he trying to say here? I think what he's trying to say is a lot of the common people of that time think that the gods are meddling in human affairs, that the gods are like um, having, a, ha having a, uh, affairs with each other and like, drama. I don't know if people know about Greek mythology. There's all this drama. And I think Epicurus is saying, hold on. The gods aren't like that. If there are gods, the gods are immortal, blessed, and they don't bicker and squabble, and they don't meddle in human affairs. That's the first thing to realize. So Ariana, to tie this into your question, Epicurus is kind of like, the gods don't really interfere in human affairs our leaders do. So that's why it's important what I'm saying about an individual good life that can tell us how we should govern our own society. Yeah, cool. I like this. I could talk about this all day. Maybe we should move on to our topic for today, which was the reading that you did for Wednesday, actually. So you got to think back to what that was. That was um, Fred Feldman. My good friend, Fred Feldman. He is my friend. I mean, this guy was my dissertation director, which means that when I wrote my dissertation in graduate school, he was the guy who helped me write it. So to get a PhD, like most of your professors who have PhDs, you have to write a very long paper. Mine was like 150 pages. Fred Feldman was my director of this paper and he was at UMass. Okay, he defends a view called hedonism or we're gonna consider hedonism. Epicurus also was a hedonist. So in the thing that you read for today, no, that you read for Wednesday, Fred is gonna to try to explain some of the different theories of the good life. That was for Wednesday that you read that. Nice, thank you, Rowan. Look at that, he's got a Wikipedia page. And to think that I go to this guy's house and help him chop wood, and he's a celebrity. Okay, so let's do a quick recap of what we talked about on Monday to help us enter into our discussion for today. First, Fred thinks it's very, very important that when we talk about the good life, we have the same idea in mind as the person that we're talking about it with. We want to avoid a merely terminological dispute. And I gave an example on Monday of a very silly terminological dispute, 
Boris says, I'd have to say Massachusetts is the coolest. Enid says, are you kidding me? It's Alaska. They could be talking past each other. Boris is thinking about awesomeness. Enid is thinking about temperature. That's not good because they're not actually disagreeing with each other. So when we look at different theories of the good life, we wanna look at theories that are opposed to each other so we can sort out which of those theories we think is true. So Fred gives us five different conceptions of what we even mean by good life so we can be clear about what our theories of the good life are supposed to be about. So here are five distinct conceptions. The first idea is the idea of a morally good life. And a person lives a morally good life if they act virtuously, live honorably, do their duty. Check it out, we got Mother Teresa. Good old Mother T lived a highly morally good life. There's also the useful life. This is the life that's good for others. This crossing guard here lives a very useful life, helping children cross the road since 1982. Wonderful, we can thank her for that. We also have this concept of the beautiful life. Okay, the beautiful life is a life that would make for a beautiful story. So we'd like to read about that life in an autobiography. I hate to say it people, my life is not a beautiful life in this sense. I've lived a pretty straightforward, boring life. But maybe you can think of others who have lived some pretty tremendous lives with rockiness and adversity and struggle and, and it's a beautiful life in the sense that it's very uh, compelling to think about their life as a work of art. We also have the model life, okay? A person lives a model life if their example of, is, they just live like a standard example of a life. Like if you were an alien creating a human zoo and you wanted to find the perfect typical example of a human being in our society, you might choose this guy here who's working behind a computer in an office. Very typical example, that's the model human life. And finally, by the good life, we might mean something like the life that's high in personal welfare. Feldman also calls this the life that's good in itself. And the way to get at this notion is to do the crib test. Imagine that you're a mother looking at your child. You really want that kid to live a good life you're probably not thinking that you want them to live a beautiful life because you don't really want them to have too much struggle or trial or tribulation. You're probably not thinking that you, want them, that you want them to live a model life. You don't really care whether they live a typical human life. You want your child to have a life that's good for them, that's good in itself, high in personal welfare. Okay, so these conceptions all come apart. And I like this example of Mother Teresa because it illustrates that you can live a, mer a morally good life. You can live a life that's good for others and yet a life that's very low in personal welfare. I read through Mother Teresa's journal many years ago. It's depressing. There are parts in her journal where she says, I am lost, I feel empty. Where are you, God? And this, this happened for 20, 30 years of her life, a huge span of her life where she felt like her whole life was meaningless. Tremendous suffering. She did a lot of good, very useful life, but not so clear that it was a life that's good in itself. I also, I really like this passage from the Feldman article that indicates that there is a difference between a beneficial life and a life that's good in itself. So let me just read the first couple sentences here. He says, I think it's interesting to note that this talk of the beneficial life presupposes the concept of the life good in itself for the one who lives it. Presumably, when Mother Teresa benefited others, she did this by making their lives better. But when we say that she made their lives better, we surely do not mean to say that she made their lives better for others. That would just introduce a long chain of lives, each making the next better for others. 
Rather, what we mean is that Mother Teresa helped other people to live lives that were better in themselves for those others. So anybody who's trying to live a morally good life, what they're concerned about is making sure that other people live lives that are good in themselves. Right? That's what it is to live a useful life, is to promote personal welfare. So this helps us narrow in on the notion that we're concerned with. I think the notion of a life that's good in itself is very important. And it's probably the idea that this granddaughter has in mind when she talks to the grandmother. Hopefully you lived a life, grandma, that was good in itself for you. And that's what we all want. As, as you know, students here, we're thinking about our futures. We're trying to pursue a life that will be good for us high in personal welfare. And we talked about some good examples last time, but my internet connection was pretty lousy for why these other concepts are different. Okay, are there any quick questions about any of that stuff? Okay, so Feldman wants us to be focused on the life that's good in itself. Now, he makes a bunch of other distinctions in the reading that you did for Wednesday. And I'll just talk through a few of these. The first is he wants to be very clear that he's not offering any life hacks. And Epicurus is not really offering any life hacks either. You know that, sure, it sounds like they're giving some practical advice, but really these philosophers are concerned with something a little bit deeper, a little bit deeper. Um, you know, my uncle Mike, he's retired. He is uh, driving around in his RV with his wife and my, my Aunt Pam. And he says to me, Bob, the key to a good life is a glass of wine every day. That's key. I think he's giving me some practical advice there. I don't know if it's good advice. Maybe you have different advice that people have given to you. Graduating college, that's the key to a good life. Um, Feldman says he can't give us any practical advice like that. I actually can't do that either. <laughs> but he's not concerned to give us practical advice. He wants to answer the theoretical question, what even is a good life? In fact, we can't even consider whether that practical advice that my uncle Mike is giving is any good unless we already know antecedently what is a good life. So the, the question we're concerned with is fundamental. We want to know what the good life is first before we can evaluate any practical advice that we might get. Okay. Another thing that Feldman really wants us to notice is he thinks that the complete theory of the good life is gonna give us two things. So first, as we talked about last week, it's gonna give us necessary and sufficient conditions for a life to count as a good life. But second, he says that a complete theory will give us some sort of ranking system by which we can compare two or more lives based on their goodness. We want to be able to say, this person's life was much better than that person's life. Maybe we can think of a, of a variety of different lives, some of which are really low in personal welfare and some of which are really high in personal welfare. We wanna know what is the basis of that comparison. Of course, I don't know, this is an interesting question. Is it too much to ask of a theory that it will allow us to rank lives in terms of their goodness? And this is open-ended here. Do you think it's possible to rank lives in terms of their goodness? I don't know, what do you think? Is it possible to rank lives? What do you think, Jess? I don't like it. I think that comparison is the thief of joy. And by comparing like one life to another, that means that one of them is going to be inferior and then 
you know, whereas you can just appreciate them both or you can compare them and say, oh, this one's a little worse. And then you'll always be a little bit more critical about it. So I, I don't like this idea at all. One problem, I'm gonna put it in the chat. One problem is comparison is the thief of joy. When we rank, it's gonna imply that some lives are a very low welfare. And that's not a nice thing to say. <laughs> okay, Rowan, you had a hand. Uh, oh, I was gonna say that I feel, I feel when it comes to, and we're coming to the idea of a theory, and you know, there's a little part where Feldman talks about, you know, just being rooted in the kind of objectivity. I feel like whenever we're dealing with objectivity, it's almost inherent that we're gesturing towards a kind of hierarchy, which I think can be unpleasant. But a life, if you were to compare it, like if we get to this theory, you can compare. One life you say it was less good in itself for this person than this person's life was going to suffer for them. I don't think that's a different thing than saying their lives have different value, as in just, you know, I guess extrinsically, you wouldn't say this person's life because it was less good in itself for them. I mean, they had an inferior life. I mean, there's different types of value, but I do get the why it can be just kind of, uh, but yeah, I feel like you would be able to rank them. It might be hard. But. I feel like you've maybe given sort of a reply to an anticipated problem because you i think what i'm hearing rowan is that when we rank lives we shouldn't think that what we're doing is saying that one person has less dignity than another we shouldn't be thinking oh they're inferior because their life has lower welfare instead uh, we can separate the notions we can rank a life is it good for the person how good is it for the person and we don't have to then infer anything about whether that person has moral worth, whether they matter. Is that what you're saying? Am I capturing that okay? So ranking is different than, there's my little motto for it. Okay, I saw, Alana, is it a follow-up? And then we'll go to Molly. Uh, no, Molly can go first. She had her hand up like five minutes longer than me. Okay, I just, if it was a follow-up to what Rowan said, I want to make sure we cover it. No, it wasn't really a follow-up. It was like kind of like just back to like the original idea. Okay, so let's go to Molly and then we'll come back to you, Alana. Okay, Molly, go for it. I was going to jump off of Rowan's point that I think hierarchy, while it might not be fun, like as humans, we might not enjoy the sense of hierarchy, even though a lot of us benefit from being on one hierarchy or the other. I think it's necessary. And I think Rowan was bringing that up, but especially in the discipline of history, like I can't read about everyone's life. I can't do it. So I need to know who to read about and why I should read about them. Because at some point we need to like move on as people, we, like as a society, we can't just be focused on every individual's one good life. Okay, I, I, I don't know how to capture it in the chat. Ranking helps us to determine which lives are worthy of our attention. And so this is definitely true of morally good lives. If we were talking about whether it's possible to rank morally good lives, uh, yeah, that's definitely possible. I mean, Mother Teresa was much morally, she's a more moral person than I am and a much more moral person than a drug lord. So, you know, we can rank morally good lives and that's important because it helps us determine which lives deserve our attention. The ones of the morally good people. And so the same thing you might think could be said about lives that are high in personal welfare. We, if we rank them, it allows us to focus on the lives that we aspire to live. What's bad about that? Okay, Alana, you had a hand. I was just thinking of the good place, the show, because like, we can't really like rank a life because you'd have to do like what they did, like a kind of a point system of like, oh, like you get like minus five points. Cause you like, I don't know, like you stole a dollar. So like, it's hard to place, like measure, like what would be ranked higher than somebody else. Cause somebody could do a really good task, but they're just doing it to get community service hours and somebody else could do a really good task, but it's because they genuinely want to help the community. So it's like, how do you actually rank these people based on their like morally goodness or personal welfare? Like it's just be really hard to rank in general. 
So I put it in the chat, like the point system is too complicated. Even like a supercomputer can't crunch all of the variables to actually generate some output. There's way too many factors that go into personal welfare to allow us to make a meaningful calculation. Yeah, Jessica, Jess. Yeah, I, I agree with what Alana said. You know, we are, we as individuals are the only people who have like lived in our brain and know, you know, everything that we do. And I think that it would be exhausting to thoroughly evaluate the value of someone's life by going through every little experience that shaped their decision making and why they like this and why they like that. Like either you're going to absolutely exhaust yourself after doing one life or you're going to do the person a disservice by not, you know, reading deep enough into why they are the person that they are to where I think that you wouldn't capture an accurate picture of how good their life was. Yes. And Ari, you want to follow up? Um, going off of that, if you're looking at it like a point system in determining the good life, you could see a bunch of things and like determine like, yeah, like that, that's, that's a good life. But like, I think that's like not as correct because it, if it doesn't like lead them to be happy or if they don't feel like they're having a good life, like it goes back into that thing that we read that was objectless theory. So like, on paper, it could be like, yeah, like you did all these things, like you fulfilled everything, you led a good life. But like, if you're unhappy, then like you didn't lead a good life. So it's sort of like the ranking system might imply my higher, my, what matters to me onto somebody else. Okay, Molly, you're trying to capture this idea in sort of a way, like my rubric, my life rubric, might not apply to you, Ari. And it's like, you do, you, you might check all the boxes on my life rubric, but if you're not happy, you haven't lived a good life then, you know, even though you checked my boxes. So to rank lives, how do we do it? We'd have to be able to escape our own perspective on what matters to us and somehow be able to get into somebody else's head. Let me, we can't escape our own heads. How am I gonna do a ranking of what matters to you if I can't even get out of my own perspective? Okay, Kiki, you had a hand I saw. Yeah, I just kind of follow by Molly and um, like Molly's idea, like who made this rule, like who like pawned this for us, like who do the uh, like check pawn for us and also like for the rubric, like who to make them like why they made them, they're all unclear and we still have so many discussion about what a good life is. And also people are, will now be really educated by what good life look like. So maybe they're so confused even by like room maker or like leader or something else. I'll put it like this maybe, and this is just one of the things that you mentioned, but questions of the good life are kind of subjective, you know, they kind of are a function of, you're, you're nodding, this is kind of what, one of the things you were suggesting, and it's like how, yeah, is that, did I get it right, Kiki? Yeah, okay. Is that a hand, Ariana? Yeah, I, I was just thinking, connecting off of like what they said, and then kind of what Molly said about historical like figures, and also just famous people in general, I feel like that there has to be some like popular subjective point because we have people in the world that we deem like up higher and like look up to whether it's like a political figure or, like someone like or any like famous person so there kind of has to be like some sort of like popular agreement on subjectivity of if someone's like living a good life I'd say. Yeah that's like a way of kind of getting back so I, I'm the way I'm labeling things in the chat is kind of weird. I'm using numbers for reasons against ranking. I'm using letters for reasons for. So I'll give this one a letter and I'll say, so what if it's subjective? And the idea is if everyone in this classroom agrees about some standards, we could still have an interesting discussion given our general agreement. If we can all agree, for example, that um, somebody who lives in abject poverty 
can't get can't even afford their next meal is constantly anxious about their job losing it is constantly anxious about the health of their family members is always you know suffering with pancreatic pains you know if we can all agree that person has a life that's pretty low in personal welfare <laughs> And somebody who's sitting on a cushion eating grapes and playing net, watching Netflix has a life that's higher in personal welfare. If we can agree on that, then we can at least get somewhere, even if there's no objective answer to these questions. Okay, I guess what I'll say here very quickly, because I do want to then talk about the different theories. Um, what I'll say here very quickly is that I find point A in the chat to be a compelling response to point number one, that I'm not stealing your joy when I say that your life has lower personal welfare. All I'm, hey, I'm saying you have the same dignity as anybody. It's just your life is overall worse for you than it is than my life is for me. Um, I, I think that when it comes to point number two, that the point system is too complicated, Look, I could never, this is gonna seem like a weird example, but it's just the one that came into my head. I could never count the amount of hairs on any of your heads. I just can't do it. <laughs> that doesn't mean that there isn't an answer to the question about who in this class has the most hairs on their head. I mean, there's an answer. I can't figure it out, but I'm telling you it's there. The same thing might be true about theories of the good life. even if it's too difficult, practically speaking, to compute all of the points, our general theory is still untouched. Even if we can't practically apply the theory, that doesn't mean that the theory is impossible to construct. Um, and when it comes to the claim that we can't escape our own heads, it's a very good point. I think that there's actually a theory of the good life called objective list theory, which attempts to answer that. So we will get to that. This was a great discussion, people. Lots of good ideas. Let's get back to what Feldman was talking about in the reading on Wednesday. He cares about the good life for a few reasons. He thinks that it's historically important. Philosophers have been concerned about this question forever. He thinks it's got important connections with things like rationality and ethics. So when you think about ethics, right, it's our duty to try to make people's lives go better. But how do we know how to make someone's life go better unless we know what it is to live a good life? In medical contexts, Quality of life is tremendously important. We want to be able to say of somebody who's hooked up to the IV machine, who's in a coma, what's their quality of life? Is it okay to pull the plug? But in order to assess quality of life, we have to know something about what makes a life good for the one who lives it. And I like what Feldman says, even if none of these other reasons are good, he's just interested in the question of the good life. That's why he wants to study it. So, let me go through five different or four different theories of the good life. This is an overview. And then we're going to spend much more time this semester focusing on each and every one. Stop me if you've got a burning question. But this is going to be quick, so I'm not going to be able to go into depth in, in, into any of these. The first idea comes from the ancient Greek philosophers. Oh, I did not mean to move that. Uh, the ancient Greek philosophers who said quite plausibly that the good life is the happy life. This is called eudaimonism because eudaimonia in Greek is happiness. And even today, I think it's a very plausible theory. We can put it very precisely like this. Uh, the value of a life in itself for the person who lives it is directly proportional to the net amount of happiness that the person enjoys throughout their life. So if we can calculate how much happiness you've had in your life, we can determine how good your life is. Feldman's got a problem with eudaimonism. He says that this theory lacks content. 
By that he means it doesn't illuminate anything for us. It's obvious that the good life is the happy life, but we want to know what is happiness? What is happiness? That's the central question. So we want a more particular account of the good life than just this empty, vacuous, obvious claim that the good life involves happiness. So here's another view. This is called preferentism. Um, according to preferentism, sort of happiness has to do with getting what you want. And people live good lives when they get the things that they want. More specifically, the value of a life in itself for the person who lives it is directly proportional to the extent to which that person satisfies their desires. There's lots of different versions of preferentism. It gets very kind of nitpicky. But basically, you know, there's some things that you want right now. If you got them, the preferentist would be inclined to say your life is going better. There's some things that you want for your life as a whole. Like maybe you want to be a doctor, or maybe you want to have kids, or maybe you don't want to have kids. <laughs> Whatever it is that you want for your life as a whole, according to some versions of preferentism, if you get that thing, you've lived a good life. Okay? There's sort of a distinction that we need to make among preferentist theories. What do we care about? Do we care about what you actually want? Or do we care about what you should want? So maybe Rowan here has just one aspiration. Rowan's only goal is to count the number of blades of grass that are on the quad. Rowan spends every day counting the blades of grass and achieves the goal after four years at Springfield College. Um, hey, Rowan, got you got what you want, Rowan. Great, excellent. Um, preferentists might not be forced to say that you've lived a good life because they might be able to say, well, hold on. <laughs> what you actually want is like really messed up and what you should want is to graduate from Springfield College. So. This sort of makes a distinction among preferentists. They would say that some actualist, some people are actualist preferentists. The desires that matter are the desires that a person actually has. And other people are hypothetical preferentists. The desires that matter are the desires that the person would have were they rational and well-informed. We're gonna get into this more specifically. Yeah, rational and well-informed, what does that involve? We're, we're gonna get into this more specifically, but you know, Feldman's got a problem with, well, here's, here's his problem actually for actual preferentism. It has to do with masochism. People that are self-destructive, they want themselves to fail. You know, this is so weird. Does anybody go on Reddit? Do you know this website, Reddit? I was poking around on Reddit and there's an internet trend that blows my mind. I didn't even know this was a real thing. I've seen this on Reddit. It's a person, they post a selfie of themselves and they say like, I'm 23 years old and I'm still living with my parents. And then they say, roast me. And I guess what they want is for people to then comment on this, like all of the bad things, like just to like make fun of them. Someone, you should look this up. It's real. Like, I see it a lot. Okay, so I guess some people have these masochistic tendencies. They like to feel bad. All right, I want to feel bad. If that's what you want, to feel bad, and then you achieve it by feeling really bad, the actualist preferentist says you've lived a good life. A lot of people think that's, that's messed up. So here's sort of a formal way of capturing that argument. This is why Feldman does not like preferentism. So there's different arguments, you know, here's a different one. Here's our different theories. Another theory is called perfectionism. Okay, according to this idea, there's a certain ideal person. 
there's a certain, I don't know, think about like the perfect celebrity, right? The, the, the sort of person that we all aspire to be or the person that is particularly excellent. They're doing all of the unique things that persons are supposed to do. And the perfectionist says you live a good life just as, as in so much as you approximate that, that perfect life. Um, I've got a picture of these Greek philosophers because they were perfection. These guys were perfectionists. They thought that the philosopher was the ideal human form. And to live a good life, you had to be perfect like the philosopher. Uh, Feldman doesn't like this. We'll talk about that later. Here's Feldman's view. It's called hedonism. According to hedonism, a life is better in itself for the one who lives it as it contains a more favorable balance of pleasure over pain. Feldman's got no problems with this view. He thinks it's true. And Epicurus is one of the first people to express this sort of view. We're gonna talk about this view next week. Basically, if according to hedonism, to live a good life involves experiencing pleasure. And if you wanna rank lives, you wanna see which life is better than another, you just somehow add up the amount of pleasure that the two different people have in their lives and whoever has got the more pleasure, they've lived a better life. I don't know, it seems maybe intuitive. Does anybody in the last minute have any issues with that? Yeah, Alana? It's not really like an issue because I overall I agree with it. But when he like was roasting, um, you got me thinking of the word roast, sorry, but when he was like coming at preferentialism because of the masochist, you could say the same thing with hedonism. Like what if like some like horrible like criminal like finds pleasure like killing people? Like how is that a good life if he like genuinely enjoys it and he ends up in jail and he's like, yeah, I did that. Like I killed people. So like, how is that a good life? And the whole time in jail, they're just so happy because they pulled it off, you know, and then even being imprisoned is just building onto their happiness. Um, I think I know what Feldman would say, actually. I think Feldman would say, Alana, you're talking past me, friend. You are talking about the morally good life. I'm talking about the life that's good in itself. We just had a merely verbal terminological disagreement but that might not move you. So we'll think more about whether that kind of response works. For Monday, you're reading more Epicurus. You're gonna get into the meat of the theory. Okay, so you'll finish reading the letter to Menoetius. I will see everybody uh, together on Zoom. Have a nice weekend, people. Good discussions today. I gotta let you go. Have a nice weekend. Thank you. Have a nice week. Bye. Yeah.